Yeah, I'd like to welcome you all here today. We haven't gone on the air yet, but a couple of housekeeping things. Uh, next year icon, your pic, uh, what should be a picture, you need to put your full name. Uh, Hawaii, uh, Hilal, uh, other people, you put first and last name, uh, if you like. But in the future, we need to, you know, this is professional and we'd like to have... Uh, but if you want to stay anonymous, that's fine for now uh, until we get some kind of protocol arranged. But don't want to scare you away. At first, it's a new technology and there's a learning curve. <clears throat> We're going to make mistakes. Most of the mistakes has to do with muting. Uh, so find out, like a scalpel, find out where that mute button is because you're going to have to keep it yourself muted if you're not speaking. But if you're speaking, of course, you have to unmute. Uh, and generally, <clears throat> Dr. Sabea presents and then opens it for questions. Now this is different. Usually we televise him from his auditorium in Amman, but I guess he's doing it from home. So uh, it's a different kind of setup. We're just doing it, you know, face to face, like a like a video chat, and he's obviously screen sharing. Too. Anybody have any questions before we start? Anybody want to say hi? That's all right. You're shy.
Yeah, we haven't started yet, Dr. Sabea, but man, I had a horror show the other day because Vlad was presenting from Prague and I had his videos on my computer and I was running his podcast because he had a low, bad connection in Prague. So I'm trying to run the PowerPoint and, and, and I couldn't show his videos, but I have to leave the PowerPoint, start the video. It was just, it was just a disaster. <laughs> Hope nothing of this would happen today. <laughs> oh, no. Okay. You, know, you just have a couple. Well, he had a lot of videos, operative videos, a lot of them. Uh, and uh, he didn't have really good bandwidth. So he, really, he couldn't do it on his, on his computer. Yeah. So. But you guys have to do it all the time, right? You have to open videos, close videos, and presentations at conferences, oh. right? Exactly. Yeah. So you're pretty adept at it. I'm not. I, I was just fumbling around, <laughs> but I'll learn it. You know, I'm sure it's not. Uh, how's the weather in Florida? Beautiful, beautiful day today. About 75 degrees, sunny. Uh, but you, you, you do centigrade there, right? I, I don't know what it is centigrade, but 75. But no here, one... it's, it's, here in Amman, it's about 18 centigrade. Okay, is that about the same? About 75. Uh, almost, yeah. Yeah. Almost. Okay. And what about right. lockdown in Florida? Do you have lockdown? Yes. Yes. Not, but not strict. Not strict as it probably is in some like New York and uh, other parts yeah. of the world. But generally, everyone I speak to, because we speak to everyone all over the world every day with this platform. Uh, yeah. But the Chinese say, the Chinese, like I said, they're doing elective surgery now. So they're getting back. So, sure. uh, but the here it's not as strict as I thought it would be. But anyways, uh, so you ready to start? Okay, let me introduce you first, okay? Sure. 10, yeah. 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Good morning, it's Dr. John Bennett from Miami Beach. Uh, we have the pleasure today of having Ibrahim Sabaya, MD. He's a neurosurgeon from Oman. Most people in the neurosurgery world probably know him. Uh, he's been doing this. These web, not webcasts, we've been doing these uh, multidisciplinary presentations for 27 years. Uh, of course, that was before the, uh, the internet. And I'm glad to see he has embraced this, this technology to spread his teachings. Okay, welcome, Dr. Sabay, and it's all yours. Hello. Uh, good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on where, where you are. Hello, my colleagues and friends. Uh, my name is Abraham Sabah. I'm speaking from Amman, Jordan. And with me here is my daughter. She's helping me today. She's a 50-year neurosurgical resident. Uh, in, in Amman, we would like always to empower women, uh, especially in neurosurgery, because as you all know that the number of neurosurgeons, female neurosurgeons in the world are few. Uh, I want to thank you, John, for this new way of communicating with people. You always talked about that this is the future. And with this corona crisis, this is proving to be the way of communicating and uh, talking to each other. So thank you uh, many, many times. You're so welcome. I will start now. Sure. Okay. Uh, Okay, Perfect. So, Perfect. so this is uh, uh, to say that Jordan is a country of uh, religion tolerance. And here I read east of the Jordan towards the sun rising from Joshua. Uh, Jordan is uh, well known for, uh, for being a religion tolerant country for generations, for centuries, Muslims, Jews and Christians live together in harmony. And these are some of the pictures of the River Jordan and the famous uh, uh, church in Madaba and Pope visiting the, the Holy Land. Uh, I'm gonna speak today about Clivus Cordoma and as usual, I will tackle the clinical, radiological, operative and pathological correlation. Clivus, let's start with the Clivus. Clivus is the central bone of the skull. That's why it is difficult. That's why it is formidable. So here we are, just splitting the bones, sphenoid bone, tumoral bone, and occipital bone, 
and the clivus is this part, which is a junction of the, sphen uh, the basal sphenoid with the basal occiput. So all this is the clivus. And at this junction, as I said from here, the junction between the basal sphenoid and the basal occiput, there is the synchondrosis. This is the, the joint that joins the both together. So above is the tuberculum cell, the tetra above and the hyaline cartilage below. And there is this line which de, demarks the uh, synchondrosis. It's an important landmark in the forensic medicine because it tells you that if it is closed, the age of the victim is above 18. So we divide the clivus into three zones, the upper zone, middle zone, and lower zone. And uh, as I said, this is the basal sphenoid, which is related to the sphenoid bone. Uh, the lower part of the foramen magnum, which is this lower part, is considered to be part of the foramen magnum. So when we talk about clivar lesions, we have to know what we are talking about. If we uh, take all the structures out, the brain stem, the cerebellum, then you'll come up at this beautiful view, uh, V3 of the vertebral going in to be V4 and uh, joining together here to form the basilar artery and then the termination of the basilar. Here's the th third nerve, here's the sixth nerve, fifth nerve, the facial and vestibular cochlear, lower cleanal nerve 1911, and finally the hypoglossal nerve. And uh, you know, uh, Roton taught us about the neurovascular uh, bundles and neurovascular complexes. The superior cerebellar artery with the fifth nerve, the pica with the uh, with the seventh, eighth, and the uh, ICA with the seventh, eighth, and PICA with the lower cranial nerves. Now, wh wh why am I talking uh, about these structures? Because you are going to see these structures uh, while you are operating. So, here we are. Uh, closer look at the clivus, the upper clivus, the middle clivus, and the lower clivus. Again, the trigeminal nerve going to Mikkel's cave, the sixth nerve going to, into the Rulus canal. And here is the 7 8 going into internal detrimatus, 9 10 11 going to the jugular foramen. And here in the lower part of the picture is the hypoglossal crossing over the vertebral artery. Of course, here we'll see the, the plexus of veins at the back of the clivus. And from there, we have the superior petrosal sinus. And here is the inferior petrosal sinus going to the jugular foramen. Uh, one, one important uh, landmark here is the hypoglossal canal. Lots of people do not understand the anatomy of the hypoglossal canal. This is essential if one is going to operate <clears throat> upon the clivus. The hypoglossal canal is going this way in this direction, anterolaterally, and it uh, crosses so that one third is behind and two thirds in front. So that's the anatomical location of the hypoglossal nerve. Radiologically, this is the hypoglossal canal. And here are some of the other features, the foramen spinosum for the middle meningeal artery and foramen ovale for the uh, mandibular nerve. Uh, this is the, how it appears in the coronal cuts. Again, you have to appreciate the lower cranial nerves going into the jugular foramen and the hypoglossal canal. It looks here like a head of a bird. And this is exactly what you see, head of a bird, hypoglossal canal and jugular foramen. Here is the C1, sorry. Uh, this is the uh, occipital condyle and this is the articular surface of C1. So if you take the coronal cuts, <clears throat> upper clivus, middle clivus, lower clivus, and if you look at it with the uh, anatomy preserved, the heart palate is coming at this level. So if you want to go uh, at the clivus, the lower part of the clivus, you have to split the heart palate and the soft palate. Of course, here we are seeing the tergopalatine fossa, tergopalatine structures, once the posterior wall of the maxillary sinus is removed. So here we are. This is the vomer communicating with the sphenoid bone. Uh, this is the pharyngeal tubercle. This is the edge of the foramen magnum. And if you remove the bone, this is the structures that you will face, the basilar, the two vertebrals, and the cranial nerves. This is a closer look on the two vertebral 
artery is meeting to form the basal artery and the lower cranial nerves and the hypoglossal nerve. <clears throat> of course, this is the anterior spinal artery coming from the vertebral arteries. Uh, lateral sagittal view, uh, this is the pituitary and this is the basal sphenoid. And from here on, we have the basal occiput. This is a ra rather large sphenoid sinus, but this is the clivus as a whole. Now, as, as we are speaking about the clivus and the tumors of the clivus, we have to come across the anatomy and the embryology of the notochord, which appears uh, at the third week of gestation. Uh, this is the uh, uh, ectoderm, and this is the junction between the ectoderm and the uh, neural plate. So neural plates start to invaginate in the mesoderm to form the muscles, and here appears the notochord. The neural fold is trying to be complete to close the neural uh, tube, and the uh, notochord is here. <clears throat> Uh, this is the completion of the uh, closure of the neural tube, the lateral somites, the mesoderm, and the notochord. And this is actual uh, embryological specimens showing the neural tube and the remnant of the notochord. At the end of the day, the notochord will disappear, having done its function, and it will contribute to formation of the nucleus pulposus of the disc. So uh, this is the only remnant of the uh, notochord, and that's why it will appear in the whole of the skeleton from the skull downwards towards the sacrum and the coccyx. So what are the tumors of the uh, clivus? So many, but if we're speaking about the tumors that are arising from the notochord, like in this case, we have two types of tumors, either they are benign, I'm, I'm speaking about the tumors that arise from the remnant of the notochord, benign or malignant. Uh, I found that lots of people, they confuse the issue of tumors of the clivus. They are all lumped and summed into a clivus cordoma or clivus whatever. No, we have benign tumors, we have malignant tumors. And there are three benign tumors here uh, arising from the notochord. Benign notochord tumor, eucordosis, phylliciferous, and chondroma. These are three benign lesions. This is the first one, the benign notochord cell tumor. Uh, here, there is a sclerosis of the bone rather than destruction. In chordoma, there is destruction, while here, uh, there is actual uh, sclerosis. The second type of the tumor is achondrosis uh, phylliciferous, uh, like this case. And this is a paper published in 2013 in the Journal of Neurosurgery and Pediatrics about this uh, achondrosis phylliciferous. And this is, was described by Anne Osborne and uh, uh, William Caldwell from Salt Lake City. Again, another case of unique of uh, case of uh, achondrosis. Again, described in the Journal of Radiology 2009. Chondroma is a benign lesion, and we should not be confused with chordoma. Why chondroma? It's cartilage, and the cartilage is there in the clivus. So this is one of the types of echondroma in chondroma, where it grows inside. This should not be confused with chordomas and other tubes. This is called Olier's disease. The malignant tumors here we're talking about osteosarcoma or chondrosarcoma or chordoma. Now, there is uh, confusion in literature, uh, even in the papers published about what is the incidence of chordomas and others because they were all lumped together. So the recent studies are the more accurate because now we can differentiate chondromas from chondrosarcomas from the others. This is osteosarcoma where you will have tumor either chondroblastic or osteoblastic like this region here. Again, this may be interpreted by radiologists as uh, chordoma, it's not. Chondrosarcoma, again, which arises from the mesenchymal tissue or embryonic rest of the uh, cartilaginous matrix, totally different from chordoma. There is a, a classical type of chondrosarcoma that appears in the cranium. The others here, they don't appear in the cranium, they appear in other parts of the body. 
So these are some of the pictures of uh, chondral sarcoma. Classical chondral sarcoma appears more in females and classically it is not in the midline, it's off the midline. So that's how you differentiate between chondroma and chondral sarcoma. So chordomas now, which is the subject of the presentation today, it's a malignant tumor. It is rare, 1% of intracranial tumors. It is slowly growing and filtrative, but it is malignant. Earlier on, some papers considered chordoma as benign. They are not. Now, everybody in recent literature, chordoma is malignant. And who described the chordoma first? It was described in 1984 by this man, Hugo Rippert from Germany. So clavus chordomas, the subject of the presentation, uh, you will find something that is really frightening. 50%, almost 50%, even more, you have cavernous sinus involvement. Look at this, involving both cavernous sinuses and look at the deviation of the, uh, of the carotid artery there. This is one of my cases. Again, another frightening uh, thing about it that they metastasize. The recognized metastasis in living person is seven to 14%, but the alarming issue that up to 30% of autopsied cases show subclinical metastasis. So this is a very giant infiltrative malignant tumor. What are the locations for chordomas? They like predilection for the sacral coccyx areas, about 50 to 60%, other vertebrae less, Skull base 25 to 35. So sacrum hooks is the first location, skull base, the clivus is the second location. In the sacral coccygeal area, it is the most common location. And look at this, chordoma is the most common primary malignant sacral tumor. So if you look at the sacrum and you think this is malignant tumor, this is chordoma. Other vertebrae, yes. They have predilection for cervical spine more than the lumbar, more than the thoracic. And for one reason or another, most of the cases love to uh, uh, locate themselves in C2. So clavus chordoma is the second most common. Again, uh, most of the uh, literature says that it's equal between males and females, but as I will see in my series, that females are two to one uh, comparing with males, usually adults, 30 to 70 years old and uh, mostly Caucasian. It can be extradural, it can be intradural, they can be both. And the one which is intradural is very rare, but it has better prognosis. What are the types of chordoma? Again here, chordoma, which is different from chondrosarcoma, which is different from osteosarcoma, which is different from the benign lesions that we described, echondroma, aliceferous, or the uh, uh, the other types of benign tumors like chondroma. Chordoma is made of three types, the conventional type, the chondroid type, and the de-differentiated type. Again, this is a new concept in the histology of these lesions, which was not known before. That's why if you read the literature about chordomas between the past and now, the great difference, because in the past, they were lumped together as clivus chordomas. So conventional chordoma, will have bone and cartilage which is destroyed, plus bubble-like cells. Look at this, really looking like bubble. So the terminology is correct. Sometimes you have cartilage more in these chordomas. It's called chondroid uh, chordomas, and it is better prognosis. The de-differentiated chordoma is the worst. It is the most aggressive, it has the worst prognosis, and it is rapidly fatal. So if I want to, uh, Put them in terms of uh, better to worse types. The chondroid type is better than the conventional type. It's better than the differentiated type. For one reason or another, they are associated with tuberous sclerosis. And I have about eight cases of tuberous sclerosis in my series. And I found clavus chordoma in two of them. And looking in the literature, uh, it is says that the tuberine and hamartine proteins which is part of the uh, tuberous sclerosis formation, they will uh, inhibit the motor signaling pathway and therefore they will have tumors, especially clivus chordomas. 
if you say a lesion in the climbers, what would be the differential diagnosis? Uh, just a few of them, not all of them, and I try to uh, to collect them from my series, but I, but not all of them. Uh, this is one of my cases: the climbers chordoma, chondrosarcoma, metastasis, lymphoma, epidermoid involving the uh, Michael's cave and going there, fibroma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma, plasma cytoma, one of my cases, very rare, no other plasma cytoma in the body. Uh, pituitary adenoma can actually destroy the clivus completely if it's giant and invasive. Metastasis is always on the minds. Sinonasal carcinoma, rhabdomyosarcoma, adenocarcinoma, undifferentiated, Ewing sarcoma, nasopharyngeal carcinoma. So the differential diagnosis is really wide, and one should not limit himself or herself to one diagnosis. And the most important question is, is this chordoma or chondrosarcoma? Chordomas are midline, chondrosarcomas are off the midline. That's one major uh, difference. And there are now recently the uh, immunohistochemistry chemistry tools that we have. Uh, in chordomas, you have positive uh, epithelial membrane antigen, positive cytokeratin 7, low molecular weight cytokeratin positive, S100 positive. These are all positive in chordomas and they are negative in chondrosarcoma. What is the management of these clivus chordomas? <clears throat> Surgery first and foremost, and followed by radiation. Why? Because you can never, no one surgeon on earth can say that I have done total radical excision of the clivus uh, cordomas. It is impossible. So your aim is to do as much as you can, as clever as you can, and then complete the mission by doing the radiation. Uh, citing this... Uh, Citing this paper uh, from Shantanath Singh in, in New York, published in 2010. In this period of time, they had 71 patients, 50% recurrence within a period of 1.5 years. That shows you how bad is these chordomas. They had seven mortalities. Again, looking into literature, looking at the authors and their publication, and look here at the how much percentage of resection. 3%, 0%, 29%, and so on. So the percentages of total resection by giant neurosurgeon is small. Again here, Samuel Mifti, 45%, Sami, 40, 49%, and so on. So the prognosis in general for clival cordoma is rather bad. Recurrence is common, they can see along the operative tracts, and in general, prognosis is typically poor. poor. Uh, look at this, 10 years survival is less than 40%. So more than half of your patients will be dead by 10 years. That if you have done the right surgery and you have given the right radiotherapy. So how do you reach to these lesions? Approaches depend on whether the region is in the upper clivus, middle clivus, or lower clivus. So the yellow is the upper clivus, uh, this color is the middle clivus, and this color is the lower clivus. So the size, the direction, the location of the tumor would decide the approach. And look at the approaches, so many. Transphenoidal, whether it is microscopic or endonasal, uh, endoscopy, transethmoidal, craniofacial, transoral, subfrontal, transbasal, frontotemporal, transcavernous, terional, anterior, and posterior, Pre-sigmoid, retro-sigmoid, far lateral, extreme lateral, transcondylar. All depends on where is the lesion and the size of the lesion and whether it is midline, uh, whether it is in the upper, middle, or lower third of the clivus. So this lesion, which is in the middle of the clivus, relationship with the carotid is different from this lesion in the upper part of the clivus, different from this lesion, which is in the lower part here and with the vertebral artery. I love the retrosigmoid approach and it is the, the uh, workhorse of my, my cases. Uh, sitting position, uh, I love sitting position. I've been practicing this for tens of years and uh, we do the cranial nerves monitoring. We can use the navigation uh, uh, and so on. And we insist that the patient should 
be awake on the table before we send him to the ICU. If the patient is not awake, there is a problem. You have to find it, but do not put patients on ventilator with the claim that we want to rest the patient. This is not on, this is not scientific. People don't put patients on ventilators to make them rest. They put them on the ventilators to hide what the findings are. So with a sigmoid, whether in the sitting position or in the park uh, pinch position, it's just the same. I love this. I try this, but I feel comfortable with this. Simply, everybody is comfortable with whatever he does. I, if you just go into one type of approach, you'd be a prisoner of that approach. So I learned the other approaches here. And this is one of my cases. We are trying the pre-sigmoid approach to take the tumor uh, from here. Also, we love the uh, transbasal approach by frontal. You can reach from the uh, top of the, of the, of the anterior cranial base down to the foramen magnum. The anterior vitrosal, the Kawasi approach is well known and we have tried it. This is the Kawasi triangle. If you go from there, you would get into the upper third of the clivus. The far lateral approach, and this is a good paper by Victor Rosso, published in 2012 in neurosurgery. Endoscopy. Endoscopy to me is the future of neurosurgery. It is really pushing the envelope very far and it is progressing very nicely. Long learning curve, but it is there for the future neurosurgeons. So whether the uh, lesion is the midline, upper, middle, lower, and whether it is off the midline, it can be reached by endoscopy. Uh, this is a transclival endoscopic approach. You will come to the basilar. You will see the uh, paraclival segment of the, uh, uh, of the carotid artery. Here is the bend and here is the uh, petrous part. So depending on the lesion, whether it is here or just here, intrapetrous, or away from the intrapetrous down there, still it can be reached by the endoscopy. One of the papers published from these giants of endoscopy, Gardner, Schneiderman, Karu, and uh, Amin Kassam, uh, endoscopic intranasal approach for clival chordomas. It is really progressing very fast. What about radiation? Different types of radiation, photon therapy, gamma knife, proton, and carbon ion. The most important radiation uh, available for us in the Middle East is the photon and the gamma knife. We had the gamma knife in Jordan back in 1996. We were country number 14 in the world acquiring the gamma knife. Uh, alas, we don't have the proton beam, which is only found in four or five centers around the world, mostly in the United States. But look at this, clavus cordomas are radio resistant tumors. So that's why you have to do your effort to do good surgery, to remove as much as you can from the tumor and follow that with radiation. But again, to give radiation here with the conventional method, the dose should be high, 55 to 80 grays to get some response. So for conventional, it is highly red resistant and you must use a higher radiation dose. And when you use higher radiation dose, you'll get complications. This was recognized from old times. This is by uh, Dr. Cotton, 1996. 100% failure rate with the use of less than six degrees. So to get some response, it has to be higher grades and therefore you'll get complications with lack of response. Look at the gamma knife. This is a beautiful paper by Dave Lansford from Bisper. It is six centers. It is consortium of uh, people, of centers. They had 71 patients. They came with the bizarre kind of uh, result. This, they said that if, they, if the patient had prior radiation or if the patient had no prior radiation, so you have done the surgery, refer the patient to them, or you do the surgery, give radiotherapy and refer the patients to the gamma knife. They found that if the patients did not receive radiation before gamma knife, the results are better. I cannot explain that. What about proton beam? As I said, it is very useful, but it is not available. It's very expensive. Uh, but Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston is the most uh, uh, 
uh, experienced center around the world, and they're reporting five-year local control of 70%, 10-year local control of 50%. And this is one of the papers from another center of uh, program beam in Jacksonville, Florida. And again, here they show their uh, experience with this kind of radiation. <clears throat> about chemotherapy, useless, insensitive to chemotherapy. So again, the summation of this is that you do your good surgery, remove as much as you can, drill pieces of bone as much as you can, even the bone that look to be normal, they are infiltrative, and then follow that by radiotherapy. Talking about my series now, between June 90 to June 2018, I had 32 patients. I consider myself my lucky to have this number of patients in this room because these are rare tumors. And why did I stop at 2018? Because you need at least two years before you include your cases in any study. Again, as I said, against the rule of the literature, they say males equal females. My series contained females more, 22 females and 10 males, mostly others. <laughs> In my series, the histological types of these chordomas, the 32 patients, mostly conventional chordoma. Five are contrived chordoma, and two, unfortunately, were differentiated. This is the worst. This is better than this. And this the same period, I had only two, three cases of chondrosarcomas. Presentation, very, very uh, interesting. Then the nerve presentation, Cranial nerve deficit, but mostly sixth nerve. So if you have a young patient with a cranial sixth nerve palsy, think of a clival lesion, clival, petroclival meningioma, clival meningioma, clival lesions, etc. And another interesting point here is neck pain. Three of the patients' presentation was only neck pain. And I'm asking my colleagues, how many patients come to your clinic with neck pain you think of clival scotomas? My patients, cranial nerve, Sixth nerve, third nerve, sixth nerve. These are my patients. Here is the hypoglossal nerve where the tongue is deviated to one side and the uvula is deviated to one side. In my series, I, I cannot say, no one can say that we have done total radical excision. You end with doing subtotal or near total. That's if you are really putting your head into the job and doing your uh, job rightly. So 30, 30 cases uh, were done as subtotal or near total, and two were only partial. And when we say partial, we mean even a smaller biopsy. What did we do after surgery in my series? We gave radiation for all of them. 28 cases received radiation after surgery, and four cases received gamma knife. And we had long follow-up, up to 120 months, because we started this surgery early. What happened to those people who had surgery and radiotherapy? I had regrowth in eight, which is expected. I operated on six of them to refuse surgery. What is the overall result in my series? In 32 patients, after surgery and radiotherapy or gamma knife, 12 were alive and well with the follow-up period, 10 had fair course, four were poor, and six died. In fact, one of them died I uh, will call it per operative mortality because she died, she came from him and she died within three days of surgery. Uh, in my series, I collected the CT scan. I want to share it with you. Uh, CT is very useful. It will show you the destruction of the clivus as, as you can see here. These are all my cases. Again, you can see the value of CT to tell you the extent of the lesion. Here is complete destruction of the occipital combined. And here in the sagittal CT scan, you can see the changes, the bony changes within the climate. So CT scan is a useful tool in the diagnosis. MRI, this is a famous picture from Anne Osborne book. It is called thumb inside the climate, as if you have penetrated the climate and you went to the brainstem. So here you are before contrast, T1 after contrast, this is T2. And the diffusion study, usually there is restriction because this is a very uh, condensed tumor. 
as you can see in these uh, MRI images. This is some of the uh, pictures in my series, the axial cut and unfortunately most of my cases come in a very large size. I uh, would wish, I would love to have small uh, cordoma, but I did not. So you have seen the, the axial, now the uh, coronal, again, large, large cases. And as I said, the number is, is, is 32, but in this period of time, I get most of them from the surrounding uh, countries. This is the sagittal, again, you will appreciate that they are really large size. And these are the challenge. These are formidable lesions. And either you know or you don't know to deal with them. So if you don't, don't. The angiogram, in my cases, again, it can show you, just look at this, how much of the, uh, the paraclival and the, the petrous carotids are displaced. And here again, the, the distance between the carotid and the vertebral basal is pushed. Same thing here. Remember that 50% they have cavernous sinus involvement. Look at this here, how the carotid artery is displaced. And this is uh, the vertebral basilar is, is displaced. So CT, MRI, and angiogram. And sometimes when you do the angiogram, you may feel that you need to do uh, embolization. I've never had to do that except in one case where uh, we thought it is very vascular, because when you do angiogram, there are complications uh, that you may have to pay. But if it is not necessary, don't do it. Here we did it and we embolized uh, the feeders. Isotope can be helpful. And uh, you can see the region here is writing up. I will go through some of these cases of mine. Uh, 22-year-old female patient who came from uh, from Sudan. Uh, this is the legion before surgery, preoperative. And this is how it looks through teriodal approach. Optic nerve, optic nerve chiasm, and this is a tumor presenting in between. Actually, this case was referred to me as a pituitary tumor. And it tends to be a cordoma. And this is postoperative and radiotherapy. This is the optic nerve complex appearing inter-optic inter, uh, nerve or optic carotid uh, approach. And this patient, we use the uh, transbasal approach. You can see the extent of the lesion. And this is 58-year-old male patient from uh, Libya. And this is how the anterior cranial fossa looked at the time of exposure. We went through that into the level of the foramen magnum, and we just uh, reconstructed it and closed it watertight. And this is the effect you compare pre and post. So you don't just want to take piece of tumor or 30% of the tumor, go for as much as you can, really as much as you can uh, to give the patient the best result for radiotherapy to succeed. A uh, 21 year old female patient from Yemen with this tumor, extensive tumor, although it looked not in the midline, as we said, the differentiation between chordomas and chondrosarcomas, that chordomas are the midline, this was a chordoma off the midline. And let, this is the picture that we have seen from a, a retrosigmoid approach. Uh, these are the nerves going into, this is the patient, the stable cochlear, and this is most of them. Another patient from Libya with this uh, first seven-year-old female with this uh, third nerve uh, injury, third nerve uh, paralysis. And we use the transmaxillary approach. Uh, uh, and this lady, and uh, funny enough, maybe the two weeks time, her third nerve uh, improved before giving the radiotherapy. Uh, this is really the first patient that I used the maxillotomy approach. Uh, that was back in 1991. 36 year old male Jordanian patient with this extensive cordoma. As you can see, it is above and below the heart palate. So the only way was to do maxillotomy. We did that. And this is the patient. And uh, this is that we show that the heart palate is completely healed and the result of the uh, surgery, which was very good. 20 year old male patient from Iraq, uh, from 
Kurdistan with this uh, tumor, a giant uh, clavus cordoma, uh, causing really severe pressure on the medulla oblongata. And look at here, uh, destruction of the occipital, occipital condyle and the foramen, uh, jugular foramen. Again, here you can see the relationship with the vertebral artery, very destructive, compressing the brainstem. Young man of 20, we did the surgery for him. Again, you can see, appreciate the result. It was very good. And uh, we used this in session. He did very well. Last case is this 41 year old uh, male patient. He has a very interesting story. <clears throat> he presented to another hospital. I usually call the other hospital, St. Elsewhere Hospital, because we don't want to disclose the name of the hospital. It is not our right to do so. But he presented to St. Elsewhere Hospital in Amman, Jordan. And this is the tumor that he had. It is really affecting the clivus from top to bottom, causing pressure on the brainstem. A really large tumor. <clears throat> what they have done there is what we are advocating not to do. They have taken a biopsy. This is not good. If you don't know to do skull based surgery, do not do it. Don't go for biopsies and sending patients for radiotherapy. It will be useless. And you are not giving the patient any justice here. So they have done transoral approach. They have taken biopsy. And this was really complicated by soft palate defect. That's the soft palate defect. So this is hard palate. Soft palate is here. There's a big hole here. Seems that the surgeon there just slit the soft palate went into the clivus, took a biopsy and went out. This is not on, this is not good. So the patient 10 days later is this, he has done nothing. Tumor is this the same. And to add insult to injury, he was sent for radiotherapy and he have received 54 rays, total radiotherapy. Now this is blocking the treatment of the patient. Wrong surgery followed by the wrong decision of getting radiotherapy is really blocking the treatment of this patient. He came to our center, this time presenting with hemilingual spasm and sudden offsets of speech difficulty. Again, we could see the, the defect in his soft palate. He had uh, sensory neural hearing loss on the right side and bilateral rosenta nystagmus. And this is a tumor, the same, just the same as it was after the biopsy that they have done and the uh, radiation. So it's a major challenge. What to do, especially that patient had radiation. We have only one option and that's to operate. This is his angiogram. You can see the vertebral here, you can see the carotids. So we have to make a plan and the plan is multidisciplinary plan. The anesthetist should be informed of what is the plan. The ENT is going to do a tracheostomy for us because we are going through the maxilla. The general surgeon is going to do the gastrostomy with him as the uh, nutritionist to give the patient nutrition after surgery. Facial maxillary surgeon is essential. Oncologist is, so it is a multidisciplinary way of dealing with things. The constant form, and I always say that the constant form should be tailored to that particular patient. There is no general constant form. I'm, I'm really, I'm not tired of repeating this because in this part of the world, this is a flimsy piece of paper called constant form, which is general for whether you are doing a pentasectomy or you're doing clavus cordoma. It's not on. Each patient has his own right to know exactly what's going on. It has to be full details. You have to tell them the full plan, the full complications and every complication possible. So this is the, the suggested session, bilateral. This is when the patient is awake here, putting him to just uh, under sedation. And here, my facial maxillary surgeon, Dr. Sartar, will start with the incision. As you can see, following the lines that we have drawn on this side, you have to be careful about the nasolacrimal duct. You have to be careful about the infraorbital nerve, the nerve of kissing, both sides. And then, as here, you have done your flaps, preserved everything here. Now you are left with the uh, maxilla to split. Here the maxilla is split in half. This is left side, this is right side. And here 
it is open. So you can see this is the tongue and this is the tumor. You have converted this very deep tumor into something like cortical meningioma. So the approach is important, but important also is the anatomy when you go in to know when, when to stop and what to do. So here you are. This is the final picture, the tongue, and this is the, uh, uh, the clavar legion. I use the navigation to help me know exactly where I am because as I said here, the complications are really tremendous if you don't know the anatomy. And we use the microscope. This is Pentero microscope. And uh, now to show you the surgery, a short video of the surgery and will be off. So again, to make orientation, this is the tongue here. And this is the region I've made incision here in the midline. I deepen the incision. Excuse me, Dr. Sabia, the, the screen is not showing. The, 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 yeah, I don't know, it fro the screen seemed to freeze. So do you want yeah. me to start yeah. again? No, no, I, okay. I, I'm seeing the slide, sir, it says surgery. That's the slide I'm seeing now. Okay. Uh, just click on the left column. Click on the slide you want to show on the left column. It's okay. I will stop the screen share and do it again. Okay. Okay. It's like a coffee break in a conference. <laughs> <laughs> Is it running? Yeah. Is it okay yeah. now? Okay, can you advance it? Yeah, I will. Uh, I, will. I, I don't see it advancing yet. Is it? No, it's not advancing. Um, is it appearing as? Is it no. appearing as? No, just to, no, it's still frozen. Maybe if you maximize the size of the screen, can you maximize? It is, it is? okay. Uh, and you, you're clicking on the slides on the left. Can you try to click on the individual slides on on the left? Yeah. Is That's, it changing? No, it's not. Oh, wait, wait, wait. It did. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. There is a. Okay. Yes, it is changing. Okay. You may it's have to do. You may have to do that. Okay, we'll do it. To do it manually. Yeah. Sure. Okay. Although we tried this before with you and it was running, so oh, okay. but this is the complications of new technologies. Yeah. We can see the slide of the open mouth view. Uh, is can that you see what? the video? Yeah, we can see the yeah, the open mouth view, uh, opera field. Um, no, the video, is it, is it oh, running? No. no, it's not. That could be the problem because you may not have the bandwidth to support that video. Uh, mm -hmm. But you did before, I ran before, didn't I? Well, you might have to not see that video. Okay, and what about this slide? Is it appearing as a slide? Yes, it is. Yes, uh, hello, excuse me? Yes, go ahead. Hello? Go ahead. Hello. Uh, 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 I just wanted to advise you to uh, click on the uh, video slide and uh, then uh, uh, click on the right, uh, the, the figures that look like a cup. And uh, this will put the presentation in, um, in, uh, in, uh, in the large uh, size and the video can run. Okay, we'll, we'll try that. Okay, yeah, sure. Just yeah, reboot, slide. reboot, uh, reboot, that's all. No hurry. We can always edit this out. Yeah. 
Just like a complication on a surgical case, so you just work through it. Okay, I think I'll just uh, proceed. And if it, you are seeing it as a slide, still slide, we just that it should be okay. So, are you seeing this now? Uh, not yet. Now? Yeah, not yet. No, you still. I think you're trying to open the. It's not opening the uh, uh, one of the videos. It looks like it's trying to open a video. Um, yeah, maybe start the PowerPoint again. Are you trying to start the PowerPoint? Have you started? Can you try to start the PowerPoint again? Okay. Instead of the video, you may have to skip the video. Okay, we'll skip it. We'll skip it. No yeah, problem. it seems problematic. Yeah, just skip the video for now. Sure. Just go to the PowerPoint. So, as I said, that. Uh, uh, doing this approach, you are uh, really reaching to the whole of the clavus from top to the bottom. You have to know your limits laterally, and you have to know where the cranial nerves are. You don't want only to remove the soft part of the tumor, you remove the bone, the diseased bone, which is soft, and that bone that appears to be healthy, also drill it. So we use the drilling here to, uh, and we continue until we reach to the dura, which is in front of the brainstem then you know that your limit is there. You don't like to convert this extra dural lesion into an intradural one, unless it is necessary. In this case, it was not. So we continue the drilling the bone until we reach to the dura from the sphenoid uh, sinus, from the uh, cella tersica above down to the foramen magnum. At the end of this procedure, we close the, uh, the pharyngeal uh, flaps. We close the soft palate and the hard palate. Yeah, we're not seeing any slides or anything, Doc. No slides? No, we're not seeing the slides, no. Sorry about that. No. What about now? No, no, no. It just shows you, it shows the screen with your video, like you're trying to open the video. I think you may be locked in that. Okay, now you're back on the screen. Can you see the slides now? Okay, not yet. You're starting it. Okay, yes, we can see that. We can see the slides. Okay, good. You can see them too, right? Yes, of course. Okay. Can you see the slide now? Yes. Okay. As I said, this is the the closure. Uh, the uh, closure of the pharynx wall, closure of the uh, uh, hard and soft palate using these mini screws, and then the repair of the one as you can see. Uh, the histopathology here was done, done by Dr. Farsakh uh, from our department, uh, chose the classical chordoma uh, lesion. It is uh, uh, cells that are separated by uh, septi and extensive myxoid stroma, uh, etc. And here again, applying the immunostaining, EMA, uh, fetal membrane antigen is positive. The cytokeratin 18 is positive. Limentine is positive. And we used uh, uh, this uh, clavus cordoma in new marker, which is brachyuria. And it is said that this protein is uh, very. Uh, exclusive for these chordomas. Uh, it is a protein that you see in the cells of the chordoma and no other tumors of the clivus. But you can see it in other tumors of the body like breast or lung, etc. But for a brachyura to be positive as a marker is a marker of chordoma. So this is brachyuria is positive. The P53 is negative as expected. And the KI67 MIP is 10%, which is malignant. 
The post-operative course went well, the patient was extubated, and of course, this is the tracheostomy tube, which we have done before surgery, and the gastrostomy tube before surgery, uh, and he recovered very well. And this is just giving us the stump up. And this is the immediate post-operative MRI, which was done the following day. Actually, it was a long day, a long surgery. I think we finished something like 7 p.m. But the following morning at 7 a.m. and the following morning, you have to have the immediate post-operative MRI, which shows that we have done a very good job. And this is the CT scan. As I said, you remove these pieces of bone that are still there. And he was discharged with this medical report. And again, medical report should not be the flimsy paper uh, that says the patient was admitted on so-and-so date and discharged on so-and-so date without any explanation. Discharge summary should be full. And discharge summary is usually done on the day of admission. You write whatever there is on the patient and then you continue filling it as you go through. So this is the discharge summary that we give for every single patient of ours. And this is the patient uh, doing well in his visit to the clinic afterwards, no current and nerve deficits, etc. And uh, his wound is healing very well. As you can see, he grew his mustache. And this is long follow up on the patient. Now, uh, we stopped here and said, what should we do next? We have done the surgery as we should, but this patient had received his. Uh, conformal radiotherapy, which was a wrong decision to do after this biopsy that was done at St. Elsewhere Hospital. So we asked them to uh, travel to the United States for uh, proton beam uh, therapy. This is his uh, follow-up uh, MRI five months later. And this is his CT scan five months later. And this is his six-year follow-up MRI, which was a very good, very good result actually. And by that time, six years, he could not afford to go to the United States for proton beam. So he was lucky that his tumor did not progress uh, with the, with the, without any proton beam. So that's my conclusions for this presentation. Cordomas may look histologically the same, but biologically they behave differently with different clinical course. So don't lump sum the cordomas with the chondrosarcomas or the cordomas. There are different tumors, each has its own biological uh, course. And uh, your surgery should be done by aggressive surgical resection. And whatever you do, the residual tumor should receive complementary external beam radiotherapy, radiosurgery, or proton beam. With this, I finish, John, and I'm ready for any questions. Okay, very good. Thank you for the excellent presentation. Clear, uh, clear uh, photos and extra uh, MRIs, etc. Okay, let's open it up. We have a lot of people in the panel, so I'm sure we have some uh, questions, Dr. Sabea, or comments. Okay, any questions or comments for Dr. Sabea? And don't be shy. This is new tech. It only is good if you use it well. Who's going to be the first to jump in? <laughs> Hello. Yeah, hi. Oh, my hi. name is Dr. Firas. I'm a consultant anesthetist. Welcome. Oh, Hello, good Chris. evening, everyone. Oh, hello, Dr. Sway. Hello, how are you? A pleasure to see you, as always. Pleasure to see you, too. Uh, my question was, uh, how long before the operation was the tracheostomy done? Was it done in the same setting or a few days no, before? It was, it was done about uh, three days before. Okay, great. That's just to know that we have don't have complications of the tracheostomy, we don't have complication of the gastrostomy. So we have done it three days before and we waited to make sure that we did not have any complication. In fact, at one stage he had increased lipase uh, enzyme, but this uh, just settled down on its own. And there was question about whether there is a pneumothorax after the tracheostomy. Again, that was cleared. So when we started doing the surgery, we were sure that the tracheostomy and the gastrostomy were functioning well. Great, thank you. Okay, more comments, questions? Hello. Hello. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, I sure can. Yes. You can. Yes. Uh, I'm Maurice, I'm Maurice Dadri from Jordan. Hello, Ibrahim. Kifak. Hello, Maurice. How are you? 
Eva, tamam. Excellent presentation. Really lovely. It's a, this this quarantine, obviously in Jordan, curfew in Jordan, made me sit at home and I can attend your talk at six o'clock. <laughs> thank you, thank you very much. <laughs> There's some advantages in that. It's really thank great you. talk. What my question is this: as a neurologist, I want yes. to know um, in the series in the uh, published in the world and in your series, obviously these cases are all very advanced. Yes. I mean, are there any reports of very early cases? where the um, tumor was picked up early for a routine MRI or CT scan. And if you do that with the patient having no symptoms whatsoever, what would you advise? Would, would uh, Obviously, from what you've told us, um, this tumor grows. I don't know how uh, fast does it grow. And would one, in, in such a case, if you do pick it up early, go ahead and do surgery, recommend surgery? How would you manage that? I mean, are there any early case, very early case in the literature and sure. if you do pick up one early what would you do about that thank you thank you maurice and uh, happy holidays happy easter uh, we did not have the chance to say hello to you personally but happy easter to all our colleagues in jordan and in the, the world as a whole uh, maurice uh, Dahdali, by the way is our uh, very senior neurologist in jordan he is well known in the arab world and internationally he divides his time between jordan and london uh, lecturing there. So Maurice is a very eminent uh, neurologist and this is a very uh, good question, Maurice. Uh, uh, these tumors are slowly growing and this is the problem with them. They are malignant, but they are slowly growing. And because it is in the clivus, in the bone, unless it reaches to the cranial nerves or you know, closes the artery, then people will pass, uh, this will pass unnoticed. So I did not have any case with a small tumor in my series. And looking into the literature as a whole, which I did, very, very, very limited number of small cases. But if I have the chance to see one small tumor and the patient is asymptomatic, I will go for surgery if I think this is chordoma. And as I said, uh, you, you can have so many ways to tell you that this is chordoma or not, even if you do biopsy at the beginning to make sure that this is chordoma or not. But definitely, if I have small tumor in the clivus and I believe it is a chordoma, I would go and do surgery for Good. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maurice. Thank you. Okay, next comment or question? Hello. Yes, hi. Hi, uh, hi, I'm Dr. Gaurav from All India Institute of Medical Sciences, New Delhi. I wanted to ask, sir, that uh, what was the, uh, the incidence of CSF leak uh, in your study? Did you find CSF leak post-op? And how did you manage it? Yes. And second question is, uh, are there any role of tyrosine kinase inhibitors like imatinib uh, in the uh, chordoma? No, uh, I will ask, answer the second question. There are no places for any other drug uh, th therapy for these tumors. And for CSF leak, yes, I had three cases of CSF leak and these are managed by just putting a lumbar drain. Okay, sir. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, next question or comment? Okay. Joanne, I'm drowning. Hello. Yeah, hi, go ahead. I'm Dr. Abu Farsakh from Jordan. Welcome. Hello, sir. hello. Uh, hi, Dr. Ibrahim, very nice talk. Uh, thank thank you. you very much for uh, extensive uh, approach and comprehensive approach of chordomas. Uh, I, ju I just want to comment on the uh, histopathology of chordoma. The main differential diagnosis of chordoma is chondrosarcoma. And that's why we emphasize to do full panel of immunohistochemistry in these cases. Uh, we used to do in the past only uh, uh, cytokeratin, vimentin, AMA, and S100, uh, which are positive in chordoma. Uh, chondrosarcoma, on the other part, is negative for cytokeratin, especially cytokeratin 18 and AMA. But nowadays, also, we we uh, had <coughs> we added <coughs> precury uh -oh. uh, immune staining. That's to confirm that it's chordoma because of the different approaches in treatment and uh, prognosis in these cases. Thank you. Thank you, Hassan. By the way, Hassan Al-Farsakh is the uh, 
a histopathologist in our department uh, is very eminent and uh, him and I have published a few papers in the American uh, College of Pathology. And uh, Hassan is very prolific in, in uh, uh, doing papers, scientific papers. I'm glad to, to, to share this friendship and the experience with him. Thank you, Hassan. Thank you. Okay, more comments, questions? Now's your chance. You won't be with uh, us to say it too often. Should we try to work the video again? Yeah, why not? Let's, let's do it. We can do that. We can do that and continue receiving yeah, the questions. Yeah, sure, sure. Let's try it. Why not? Is it working? Is it, it looks it looks like it's trying to open the file, but it's not. And fell off there. Uh, it's not on the it's not on YouTube, right? That video? It's a private video. Yeah, it's a private video. Yeah, yeah okay. I was going to say you could, I could get it from YouTube, but if it's not on YouTube. Do you, do you have Dropbox? You could send it to me by Dropbox, maybe. Well, we'll try to, to find a way and send it uh, to you, John. Okay. The whole laptop is freezing, actually. Dr. Ibrahim? Hello, Go yes. Ahead. Go ahead. Uh, Ibrahim Saidat is asking. Uh, Hello. What was... Ibrahim Saidat is asking. Hello. Uh, what was the percentage of uh, resection in the last case that you showed us? This is something like about 85%. Which is high, uh, as you told us yes. before. That's right, yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Brahim Sadat is a, a very eminent uh, young uh, ophthalmologist. He's an ophthalmic surgeon that uh, uh, deal with us in most of our cases. Thank you, Brahim, for your question. Sergi, good evening. Good evening. Yeah. Can we go for this uh, endoscopic approach? Yes. You want me to go back? No, no. If on, if can we go for endoscopic approach? Yes, of, of course, of course. But this approach of all the climbers, if you look at those all the legendary uh, endoscopists in the world, and I. Like um, I'm happy to say that I'm a friend with most of them. Uh, clavus is one of the difficult cases, the, the clavus cordomas, to do with endoscopy. So it needs long, it needs long uh, uh, learning curve. It needs a lot of experience and lots and lots of knowledge of anatomy. But of course, if you have an experienced endoscopist like the ones we we, we know and the name you know, uh, then one can actually uh, go for endoscopy. At our institute, we have. At our institute, we have done like a couple of cases with the help of uh, ENT specialists. Sure. Sure. Yeah, endoscopy is, is a good is a good way of doing things. But as I said, it these experienced people with the, with the long experience with lots of anatomy knowledge. And uh, lots of studies have been done on, on the endoscopy approach for these clubs, cordomas. And as you know now, it is progressing to go to the Tergopalatine fossa and to, to go to areas that uh, were not even thought of before. That's why I believe that endoscopy is the future of a neurosurgery. And the 10 or 15 years coming, uh, most of the tumors will be dealt with endoscopy. Yeah, thank you. Okay, I could. We think we can wrap it up, Doctor. Oh, go ahead. Go. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Go ahead, Uday. Sir, I am Doctor Uday Bhumik. I am uh, presently in the, uh, India, Rajasthan. 
So I have a question. What was your lateral extent of the uh, tumor removal? How laterally did you go, uh, and what were your what were your limitations there, so as sure. to stop the lateral extent? The limitation here, the lateral limitation, is the carotid arch. So that's your limitation, really. Yeah, whether you are doing it endoscopically or microsurgically, this is your limit laterally. That's why most of these cases they need sometimes. Uh, the combination of uh, microscopic surgery and endoscopic surgery so that you can look at the, at the corners. But at the same time, endoscopy as microneurosurgery, uh, uh, microscopic surgery, there are limitations, and the limitation here all the time is the, is the carotid arch. Is it, is it playing now, John? Yeah, it looks like it is. Okay, good. So... We'll just uh, go through that. Uh, as I said, this is the flap that we have created in the pharyngeal wall, the anterior pharyngeal wall. And here we are using the ultrasonic aspirator to take the tumor out. We are not only interested in removal of the soft tumor, we are also interested in removal of the uh, solid tumor, as you can see. So I'll just proceed here, uh, jump. You can see I'm using the sharp dissection. Uh, to remove as much of the tumor as I can. You can see this is the soft part of the tumor. Here is a, lot, a slightly harder part of the tumor. So here you can find the plane of cleavage between the tumor and the dura and the lower part of the clivus. As you can see here, there seems to be a good plane of cleavage, which is not in all parts of the tumor, but at this part, there was a good plane of cleavage. And then using again the ultrasonic aspirator uh, here I'm using high power. I'm actually using 80% power, 90% power, because this is a bony tumor in essence. Uh, and the soft tissue is the destroyed uh, bone. I'm using the surgery, removing heart uh, part of the tumor, solid, firm. As you can see, it is a vascular tumor. But one should not be disheartened. Uh, if you sort of go this way and it is, you cannot proceed, you go to the other part. So change your tactics, change your directions, change the approach, whether you're attacking the tumor from below or from above or laterally. Uh, but don't be disheartened and stopping the surgery early because this is the best chance of the patient. First chance is the big chance. And uh, you could see that when we mentioned that he had biopsy followed by radiotherapy, to me, this is a, a crime. It should not have happened. And I see this so often, especially in these kind of lesions, skull-based lesions or intramedullary spinal tumors where biopsy is taken and the patient is sent for radiotherapy. This is not gone. Uh, the radiotherapist should refuse to treat this patient uh, if he knows that surgery can be done uh, before radiotherapy. So you can see here uh, the different, this is the dura here, the white stuff that you see. Here is the remnants of bone. Now to me, uh, this remnant, this is of course the dura here, some of the tumor attached. This bone should be removed. Although it seems to be uh, solid firm, but it should be removed because it contains lots of the tumor. And uh, some people, when they remove the clivus, they put bone chips uh, to, uh, to make the stability of the spine. I think if you don't go to the occipital condyle, if you don't go to Atlanta occipital joint, uh, there's no problem with that. You don't need to put bone chips uh, or uh, uh, any kind of bone with the artificial or from the patient himself, because it will heal nicely. 
but you have to drill these bones that are in front of you because they contain a uh, tumor. And I remember a paper by Sam and Mifti about uh, uh, putting some bone graft, which was eaten by the tumor in about two or three months time. You can see here the dura, the covered by a sheet of some tumor. Still, there is a long way to go. You can just persevere and remove as much as you can and drill as much as you can. And by the way, drilling sometimes is considered by people as the function of a skull-based surgeon. No, it is in the domain of an average uh, neurosurgeon. A general average neurosurgeon should be able to use the drill in his surgery. It is not something that only the skull-based surgeons do. As you can see here, these remnants of bone uh, should be removed because here we are at the dura. As I said, literally, the uh, defining point is not to go that far literally, otherwise you will go into the uh, paraclival and petrous carotid artery. And of course, down, down, you will come across the basilar artery. So here, though this seems to be a normal bone, you drill it because you have seen the MRI, you have seen the CT scan before surgery, and you know it is involved. So this is the uh, sort of tiny little things that make a difference in the surgery. As you can see here, we're using the ultrasonic aspirator to drill this rather softish bone. So we'll just continue. Some people would stop here and say, well, I have done enough uh, decompression. I think uh, decompression is, uh, is a word that used uh, loosely uh, just to cover the incompetency of the surgeons. Uh, we stop speaking about, I have done enough decompression because there is a job that you need to do and that is to remove as much of the tumor as you can, drill the bone as much as you can. Here I'm putting uh, fat that I've taken from the patient's thigh. And then I would close the, this is gel foam. I would put a dura seal, as you can see, without mentioning the, the trade names of the dura seal or the seal of the dura uh, agent. And then I would close uh, these uh, uh, pharyngeal flaps. Now, because the patient had the tracheostomy and gastrostomy, he would not eat or drink for a couple of weeks. By that time, this one is completely healed as we have seen the patients. So I think John, that would uh, complete the, the video. Okay, very good. I'm glad we waited for that. Uh, <laughs> okay, any comments uh, on the video from the panel? Hi, how are you? Go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm Sami Khatib from Jordan. Welcome. Hello, sir. Yeah, I would like to thank Professor Ibrahim Misbeh. Always he's the best and he is joining us in that excellent lectures. Uh, so I agree 100% with my colleague, Professor Misbeh, that radiotherapy has no rule without surgery. So it's a crime when they send us some people just taking a biopsy and asking us to give them radiotherapy. Thank you, Sami. Thank you. Sami is the uh, Vardo senior, senior oncologist, uh, a radiotherapist in Jordan. And uh, he and I uh, share the ideas that lots of malpractice is, is done in this part of the world, and it is our duty to fight it. I really uh, fight the idea of taking a biopsy from a glioma and send the patient for radiotherapy. And I blame the surgeon as much as I blame the radiotherapist for agreeing to treat that patient. So Sam and I agree that radical excision will make the value and the response from radiotherapy there all the time. Thank you, Sammy, for your comment. Thank you. Thank you.
We have more questions, comments? Yeah, well, sir, one more question. Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, sir, I want to ask, which is the point when we should uh, think you now we have to stop for tumor resection? What is that exact point? Uh, I've always been asked this question. You cannot answer it by a few words. It is what you feel inside. It is your knowledge of the anatomy that makes you understand the radiology, that makes you understand what you are going to do and when to stop it during surgery. This is something that you decide in every case on its own. But there is no sort of landmark that say, okay, I will stop here. My aim, I say always that there are two types of people, of surgeons. One who is coming in with the idea that I'm going to take a biopsy or do some excision and then refer the patient for radiotherapy, whatever. And the other one who goes in with the idea, with the state of mind, that I want to remove as much as I want I can from this tumor. This you can only do if you are a good surgeon, if you had good training, if you have attended lots of cadaveric courses, if you have taught in the cadaveric courses, and knowing the anatomy. I believe the anatomy is the weakest point in, among the neurosurgeons of the world. People finish their medical school with very little anatomy knowledge of the neurology. If you ask any medical student, if you want to fill him, just ask him about the brain or the spinal cord. He finishes his residency, and then again, the anatomy knowledge is very poor, and then he goes into the training, and again, the training is poor regarding the anatomy, so he cannot read the radiology. A neurosurgeon should be able to read his images. Of course, we need the radiologist with us, but I should be able as a neurosurgeon to read my images as much as he can do. In fact, I should be better than reading them because I see them. And I remember one of the giants of radiology. I have been trained in England at Atkinson Memorial Hospital, St. George's Hospital, where Jimmy Ambrose, the man who invented the CT scan with, uh, with, the, with, the, uh, uh, with the engineer there, the first CT scan in the world was done in Atkinson Memorial. The prototype was done at seven, 1976. And uh, if, when I trained at Atkinson Morley, this Jimmy Ambrose, the man who invented the CT scan, used to come to the theater because he has seen the pictures before. And he comes to the theater to see what we are doing so that he would attain more knowledge. How many of our radiologists really come to theater to learn, to know what exactly you are using? Lots of the time you put some uh, Duracell salient and people would diagnose it as extradural hematoma because they don't know that we are using this. They see artificial things. They say, what is this? This is remnant of the tumor. I think uh, yesterday or the day before yesterday, Jaha Hanasimni spoke about leaving a clip into the cavity of the cavernous cavernoma within the brainstem so that people will stop speaking about remnant <coughs> cavernoma being there. The radiologist need to know the anatomy. They need to know what we are doing as a surgeon, what techniques we are doing, what is terrional approach, what is lateral, extreme lateral approach. So they would know the drilling that we are doing, the material we are doing, the dura that we are using. I hope I answered your question. Yes, thank you, thank you, Ilma, sir. So one more question. Which is, the most, which is the most common complications which you came across? The, the most common complication in uh, clivus cordoma surgery is increase in neurological deficits. That's the most common. So if you come with a patient who's coming with sixth nerve, you may end with increased sixth nerve with another nerve coming like trigeminal or vascular injury or whatever. So increased in neurological deficit is the main complication. And this you can only control by being good surgeon, by being good resident by attending lots of cadaveric courses, by learning your anatomy well. It's not enough to know that some people would speak about brainstem. I say, come on, brainstem is an ocean. You cannot speak about brainstem. Which part of the brainstem and which part of the midbrain is that? Which part of the pons is that? How many of the neurosurgeons around the world know this delicate anatomy? That's the secret. If you know the anatomy well, you know the radiology well, and you have trained yourself in cadaveric courses, then you can do proper surgery. Yes, thank you. Thank you, sir. Dr. Sabaya, we have a question from Guata from Indonesia, a neurosurgeon from Indonesia, I believe. He says, what was the most important thing when doing the reconstruction? 
Uh, as I said, the most important thing is, I always believe that if you deal with anatomy, you have to put back the anatomy as it is. Uh, I know of neurosurgeons in Jordan and in this part of the world and around the world who would say, don't close the dura. Uh, you don't need to. No, the dura is there. It is watertight structure. So if you finish the surgery, you have to close it watertight. So reconstruction is re closure of the dura properly, closure of the anatomical planes that you have created using fat flaps or fat tissue to, uh, to, to put it there. And as you have seen, the reconstruction of the bone in case of the maxillotomy, we have used the many screws and many uh, connections to put bones together. So all is important, the dura, the soft tissue and the bone reconstruction is very important. Okay, I believe we have another question here. Uh, let's see, did I miss anybody's questions? People have texted questions here. Um, oh, what was the percentage of resection? Does that make sense, that question? What was the percentage? Yeah, sure. of resection. As I said, no one on the world can claim that he has done full gross total resection of a clivus condom because of the anatomy, because of the structures that are there. Your aim is to do as much resection as you can. And that falls and go, goes into the category of near total or subtotal accession. So most of the cases are like that if you are doing your job properly. But to do a biopsy and send the patient for radiotherapy is a criminology. Okay, Eric, our neurosurgeon has asked, uh, how you close the operative wound to prevent CSF leak? How do I close it? If, yes, it is so yeah. Yeah. if, there, is a, if there is a stitch that I can use, yes. And I use a certain uh, clip that you can put and uh, you don't need actually to tie it. You just put it there and close it, but don't use metal clips. Uh, there are certain uh, instruments uh, long forceps with the, the thread at the end of it that you can put it and hold the dura to the edge of the bone. Okay, okay. Um, I'm just scrolling through the questions here. Does anyone else have a question while I'm scrolling? Did someone ask? I think it was. What about endoscopic approach? Was that asked before, Dr. Sabea? Yes. It was us. Okay. There's one question here I can see. Uh, it says, what were the two structures that you saved while doing the maxillary transection? Uh, you have to be careful about the uh, lacrimal uh, duct here. And you have to be careful about the infraorbital nerve because these are on their way. And when you do your cutting of the maxilla, you have to know exactly where they are. As I said, this is a teamwork. This is not one man job. This is not one man show. Neurosurgery is as such, it's a one team. And Dr. Faraz, uh, who the anesthetist to ask the question, he's in our team also. Uh, he's important as much as am I, as I am, as much as the general surgeon, as much as the ENT surgeon. So it's a teamwork and it's not one man show. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Got a lot of teaching today, Doc. It's a pleasure. <laughs> okay, any more comments, questions? And this will be recorded, of course, and it'll be on YouTube and accessible to anybody uh, that wants to go through it again. And I'd like uh, to thank, sir, go ahead, go ahead, I'm more, sorry. Go ahead. More request. Can we get that presentation on our um, mail ID? Yeah, it'll be, it'll be on YouTube. It'll be on YouTube. On, it'll be on Neurosurgical TV in the jo Jordan channel which is uh, www.neurosurgical.tv slash Jordan dash channel. All the videos, matter of fact, we have a couple of years of uh, grand round presentations. And I gotta tell this Dr. Sabay, the way he televised it from uh, Amman was simply with a laptop and a good internet connection and a webcam. Right doc? Absolutely. That's what we, that, that's what we do, it's very simple. He, he just had the courage to go ahead and try it, and it's working fine. Uh, and with don't, just you, don't have to, you don't have to travel uh, thousands of miles away and pay lots of money to attend a lecture, etc. It's all free. 
just be there because we have to disseminate the neurosurgical knowledge we have. We have to share ideas. We have to learn from each other. And that's a very good way of doing things. Okay, yeah, very yeah, thank good. you for thinking. How about yes, Wednesday, Doctor? Are you giving a note? Or, I'm sorry, does someone have a question or a comment? Yes, I am. I Go have ahead. A Go ahead. Question. Go ahead. Uh, Professor Ibrahim, thank you for your very good presentation. Thank uh, you. I already asked to uh, Professor John Bennett before about the closure and the reconstruction. I'm wondering uh, for the very large uh, chordoma, uh, have you ever uh, put some bone matrix for the reconstruction for, to the clifus or something else maybe? No, I've never done that because as I said, I believe in keeping the stability of the atlanto occipital joint, uh, even if it is involving it because if you have the chance to preserve it, preserve it. I said you cannot remove the whole tumor out. But putting a bone chips or bone graft in the area of the clivus, the tumor will come back and will eat it. And this oh. has been presented by Professor Mifti in his series. So do you, when you say you put some fat on, on that uh, space. Yes, it just because you don't want a dead space. So I put the fat and I put gel foam and I put uh, saline to dural uh, closure so that you will not end with a, a sort of a dead space. I don't put bone chips. I don't put bone grafts. Okay. Thank you very much, Professor. It's a pleasure. Okay, we have a couple more questions from Dr. Kasanov from Uzbekistan. Do you use Duragen? Duragen? Uh, if, if, if the need is there, yes, I may use it, yes, but rarely so. Okay, further question. What are the two structures you saved while doing maxillary transection? Yes. I have, I've answered that, and I said that one, okay. knowing that it's only well, uh, the two structures that are important to preserve in this kind of incision is the, uh, the lacrimal duct and the infraorbital nerve. Okay, I don't know if this was asked. How do you prefer closing dura? Simple continuous suturing or interlocking continuous? Sometimes I do it continuous, sometimes I do it interrupted according to the situation that I have, according to the integrity of the dural remnants that are there to close. Okay. What are the limitations in trans oral transpalatial api? The limitation is always the carotid in the upper part and the vertebral basilar in the lower part. These are the limitations. Okay. Very good. Okay. I think we pretty well covered most of the questions, but uh, this is a very it's a great session, and it will be available. But well, Doctor, are you Wednesday, you're giving another lecture. Could you talk about that, please? Yes. Wednesday, also 6 p.m., the same time like uh, today, I'm going to present uh, the transgeminal schwannomas. Great, great. Thank you very much, Doctor. Thank all you panelists for coming. And uh, we'll sign off now, and, uh, and you can get it on video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, stop. Okay, we're off the air. And let's get off YouTube, too.